Hello, I'm David Lewis, your University of California Cooperative Extension Watershed Management Advisor, serving Marin, Mendocino, Napa, and Sonoma counties. When developing your ranch water quality plan, it's useful to have an understanding of the water quality policies and regulations that affect grazing operations. To give you that overview, I'm going to talk first about the sources of impairment or the sources of pollution that these policies define. I'll then give a, a brief overview of both the federal and California policies relevant to grazing operations, and then end with some considerations for you and your ranch water quality plan, plans going forward. Both the federal and the California policies identify two types or sources of pollution or impairment to water bodies. Uh, the first is a point source, and as the title denotes, this is an exact place on the, on the landscape or in the watershed uh, with a known delivery of pollutants to, say, a stream or a lake. Um, it's a place that you can find, and we often think about it as being a pipe from a factory or storm drains from municipalities or residential areas. Again, an exact location on the landscape with a known amount of pollutants being delivered to the watershed. In contrast, or, or everything else is considered a non-point source of, of pollution or impairment to water bodies. Um, these are diffuse sources across the watershed, across the landscape, uh, and they deliver sediment or nutrients as pollutants, for example, when rain turns into runoff or, or snow melt turns into runoff and comes in contact with those sources of pol pollution and delivers them to the streams or lakes, the water bodies of concern. Grazing operations and, and much of agriculture is considered a non-point source, and so it's important to keep that definition in mind as we move forward, both in this presentation and the development of your ranch plan. Um, where soils maybe are, are left bare without cover and unprotected from rain, they run the risk of eroding and delivering sediment to the water bodies. And similarly, where livestock are concentrating near or in streams and manure then can deliver nutrients or pathogens to the to the water body of concern. That, those are the types of non-point source pollution that developing a ranch plan will address and how you'll be in compliance and be able to respond to these policies and regulations. So keep that definition of non-point source pollution in mind and let's move on then and talk about the federal policies first. Uh, the underlying legislation, the underlying law is the Clean Water Act uh, enacted in 1972 during the Nixon administration and amended twice in the 70s. It gives authority to the United States Environmental Protection Agency to regulate and protect water quality across the country, and it does it by mandating the states to do two things. The first is to identify impaired water bodies, water bodies that aren't meeting their beneficial uses. Beneficial uses can be things like drinking water, uh, irrigated agriculture is a beneficial use, uh, recreation, swimming is a beneficial use. Any water body that's impacted by a pollutant and, and, that, and therein that beneficial use is not being met needs to be listed and is required uh, by each state to list on the 303D list of impaired water bodies. And then the next step mandates, uh, the next step that states need to do is that with uh, a water body listed on, the, on that list, they need to develop a plan to address the sources of pollution and correct uh, the problems so that the beneficial use can be attained. And they need to do that for both point and non-point sources. Those plans almost always take the form of what's called a total maximum daily load, or TMDL. And I know this is jargony, uh, and that's the way policy is, um, but it's important that you know about total maximum daily loads. This is a process that the agencies take to first identify what the pollutants are that are impairing the water body, that are preventing the beneficial use from being obtained, and then taking the steps, the analysis, to determine how much of that pollutant the watershed can withstand, its assimilative capacity, what are the sources of the pollution, and what steps each of those sources can take to reduce the amount of pollution they're uh, contributing to the watershed and to the water body so that the beneficial use in the end can, can be reinstated. With that in mind, and, and what the, the federal policy mandates of the states, let's now give attention to the, to the California side of the policy story. And it's interesting to note that in California, water quality regulation predates 
the federal policy, the Clean Water Act, through the Porter Cologne Act. The Porter Cologne Act was enacted in 1969, and it really gave broad authority and established the State Water Resources Control Board and the nine regional water quality control boards as the entities with the mandate to protect water quality across California. Uh, and in general, it's the regional boards that take up that charge on the ground and with constituents and stakeholders. Uh, they do that in a number of ways, including, firstly, they, they're in charge of writing and updating their basin plan. This is a region-wide document identifying each water body within that region and the, and the beneficial uses for, for each of those water bodies. And that's a useful document, a useful place for you to learn about the watershed you're living and working in and the ranch water quality plan you're developing. Um, it's always useful to know what the beneficial uses are in the watershed where you live and work. It's also the regional boards that now then are charged with implementing that federal side of the policy. Uh, if a water body is impaired, listing it on the 303D list, and they routinely every other year update that list. Uh, and then taking that next step of developing those plans, those TMDLs, to address pollutants and the sources and work with those sources to implement practices to reduce any impacts to, the, to surface water quality. Before we go into more detail about California policy, uh, I want to show you a link online where you can learn about which region your ranch and the watershed you live and work in uh, is. It's important to, to use this link and to get a feel for uh, how to get more information from the relevant regional board that has jurisdiction over the watersheds uh, or watershed you're living and working in. So by clicking the link below, uh, we go to an online resource. Once on this website, there are a number of options for you to access and get detail about each regional board. Uh, there's a fact sheet here that talks about the nine regional boards another fact sheet that talks about the relationship between the state board and the regional boards, a drop-down menu where you can select the regional board of interest and get contact information that way, and then alternatively, there's this interactive map. And each of these provides you, again, that contact information and places to go where you can learn about the regional board's programs for non-point source pollution as they relate to grazing operations. Now let's go back to California policy and learn more about the programs for non-point source pollution implementation and enforcement. So returning to California policy, there's one more part or one more element we need to talk about and share with you. Um, and that's specifically the ways in which California manages non-point source pollution. In 1999, the Senate passed uh, Bill 390, and that bill uh, really reinstated the authority of the state and the regional boards to protect water bodies from non-point source pollution. And it asked the state board with its, its regional board partners to develop a policy for that purpose. That policy was finalized and approved in 2004. And most importantly in that, that policy, it reestablishes three authorities that the regional boards, each of those nine region boards, are to use to set up plans and to implement and enforce regulation uh, to protect water quality from non-point sources. Um, those three authorities include waste discharge requirements. These are really permits that either an individual operation would hold or an industry-wide permit would be put in place that all individual operations then can comply with and participate in. Um, typically, in California, these have been used for dairies, and they've been used and implemented in four of the nine regions so far. Um, the alternative to waste discharge requirements is a conditional waiver, uh, and that wording is purposeful. It's, it's a waiver to the waste discharge requirements based on conditions, based on performance standards within the waiver. So it still asks each, each operation to develop a plan and take steps to protect water quality, but just under a different authority, uh, an authority that's not a permit. And then the third authority that the regional boards have is to establish a basin-wide or region-wide prohibition for a specific pollutant. Um, for example, there could be a basin-wide prohibition for sediment discharge to streams, and that would then the, that regional board would use that authority any time there was a discharge to streams. I'm going to focus the remainder of this presentation on the waste discharge requirements and the conditional waivers because in California, that's primarily how 
non-point source pollution in agricultural operations have been uh, were, uh, handled. So there's some key elements for both waste discharge requirements and waivers uh, that are similar, and then there's a couple differences. The similarities are that each individual operator, if they want to communicate that they're going to participate and want to be included under and through either of those two programs, they need to submit a notice of intent to the regional board uh, where they live and work, where the ranch is. Those waivers and, and waste discharge requirements then also require that some sort of ranch water quality plan be developed, uh, a plan that identifies uh, problem areas and the fixes that can be implemented and even has a schedule for when and how those fixes can be implemented. There's also a compliance monitoring and reporting element um, that with some details within the waiver, for example, of, of what's required to do that monitoring. And it's important to point out that the plans and the monitoring are filed on ranch. They're not submitted to the regional board, but they, they are asked to be made available when staff come to visit. Another important similarity for these two programs, these two authorities, is that annually there's a certification that is submitted to the regional board. Um, and that's a one, one to two page form that the regional board develops and asks individual operators to submit saying that they're continuing to participate in either the waiver or the waste discharge program. And then lastly, there, there are ranch inspections on an annual to biannual basis for compliance. And these really can be looked at as educational opportunities, an opportunity for you to really communicate how you're integrating uh, production objectives, objectives for really doing good soil and water conservation practices, uh, and a chance for them to maybe even share with you other opportunities for funding or places to get technical and financial assistance um, to achieve your ranch water quality plan goals. The difference is really, are, one primarily, uh, is that conditional waivers are good for only five years. Uh, they require every five years for the, uh, the industry representatives, individual ranchers, and regional board staff to come together and revise that through a public process. Um, so there's that step, um, whereas with waste discharge requirements, once approved, they're on the books, uh, and only if they need to be amended will they be taken up again. And then the fees can be different. Um, generally thus far, waivers uh, haven't had fees or ha had only minimal fees. Uh, in contrast, waste discharge requirements have a fee schedule, um, and uh, important to point out that once a year, the state board with its nine regional boards uh, has a public process for reviewing fees, the amount and the timing, uh, and so that's an opportunity for you and, and those in your watershed or in your region to participate and provide the regional boards and the state boards input on the, the, the issuing of fees, the amounts and the timing. If you'd like to learn more about the state's non-point source implementation and enforcement policy. Uh, you can find this two-page fact sheet just by searching online. If you enter these keywords at the bottom, NPS Policy California Fact Sheet, into your search engine, up will come this two-page fact sheet. And it's a useful fact sheet giving you more detail about the policy, including the three authorities. Uh, so I recommend that you, you seek that out if you want to learn more. Similarly, if you want to take a deeper dive into the state and federal policies around non-point source pollution, uh, learn more about the Clean Water Act or the Porter Cologne Act, um, and even more detail about the implementation and enforcement policy, you're welcome uh, to seek out this fact sheet from Cooperative Extension and Agri UC Agriculture and Natural Resources. Again, if you'll just do a search on ANR number 8203, that's the publication number, uh, you will find this publication online, and uh, I think you'll find it useful if you like to take that deeper dive. So let's bring it all together uh, with regard to a watershed and doing ranch plans and, in, in a couple different ways. Uh, first, I just I share with you here a, a watershed, a, the boundaries of a watershed and the stream flowing down through the middle of it, a river flowing down through the middle. And this could be the watershed boundaries for where your ranch is, for example. And maybe that watershed has been listed on the 303D list. For example, here, it could be listed on the 303D list and may have a TMDL already approved or in process, uh, and also similarly may have a waste discharge requirement or a conditional waiver in place or in the development. Um, it's also important to point out that a watershed also will be described in a basin plan 
um, and I mentioned this earlier, but this is the, the, where the regional board describes all of the water bodies that they have authority over, and they describe the beneficial uses within each one of those water bodies. So the basin plan uh, is informed by and amended by any kind of 303D listing and the TMDL or a conditional waiver program. And all of that is led by the regional board. Um, so the regional board is really your point of contact. Uh, in, all, in all things water quality management, all things non-point source pollution management uh, in California. It's also important to realize though that anything done in terms of a TMDL, a waste discharge requirement or conditional waiver, uh, or written into the base plan is informed by and integrated with both the federal, the Clean Water Act, or the Porter Cologne Act as EPA and the state board have roles that feed into and inform the regional board's role. Another way to say this is that the Clean Water Act and the Porter Cologne Act give authority to the EPA and to the state and regional boards to protect water quality. So they're in place and with those two policies in place, the regional board's basin plans set out the beneficial uses uh, that the watersheds and that the water bodies are being managed to protect. Um, so knowing those and appreciating that uh, is the first place to start. And then learning if in your watershed, that watershed's listed on the 303D list or has a TMDL or similarly has a conditional waiver or waste discharge requirement, there'll be other important policies to look into, programs to understand if they're in place within your watershed and and, the, and if they have relevance for the ranch you're living on and operating. With that, I wanna thank you for your time. I hope this overview of policy and water quality regulations has been useful, and I wish you all the best in the development of your ranch water quality plan. You can find more informative presentations covering ranch water quality topics on the UC Rangelands website and look for the Water Quality Information Hub or direct your web browser to the URL shown on this slide.